something called carols. And uh, I don't know about you, but I wish Christmas caroling was still a thing. Like you could go door to door. Living in Arizona, I'm not trying to get shot. So I, I'm not going to people's doors that I don't know. <laughs> door to door evangelism has died because of the Second Amendment <laughs> and the state of Arizona. I'm scared of people. But um, I do wish that we could go from door to door and do a little caroling. Uh, so if anyone's got any creative way to do that, maybe we could partner with a nursing home. Let me know. I'd love to do it. But um, the reason I want to do a series on carols is because I absolutely love Christmas. I was telling my wife the other day, can we just get a house with one more bedroom so we can make a year-long Christmas room? <laughs> you can laugh at me all you want, but you cannot be grumpy going into an all-Christmas room with a little train and, the, and, and like some fake cookies and like the tree that's lit all year round. You just go in there, even if you're fighting and your kids don't like you, you could immediately, I think, be filled with joy just by going into a room full of Christmas. So this Christmas season, as we go into this series called Carols, we're going to look at a different carol every single week. And each carol, I think, will be very familiar to most of you, but, um, but maybe you'll learn some things about a carol that you never really knew was part of that song. Maybe you know the words, but you didn't really know the true meaning. And so today we're starting this series with one of, the, one of my favorite carols called Oh Holy Night. Anyone else love this carol? This is a good one. This is such a good one, and we're going to have an opportunity by video to sing this together in just a minute. So hold on to the person that's bursting to sing. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this song, Oh Holy Night, because it's interesting, the origins of this carol. I get a little geeky when I find out like where stuff comes from. So this is very interesting where this Christmas carol, Oh Holy Night, comes from. So it's the mid-1800s. There's a priest in France, and he's reading Luke chapter 2. This is where the Christmas story is derived from in the Bible. Luke chapter 2, and he goes and he says to his people, he's probably having a creative meeting, right? What are we going to put on the screens? No, I'm just kidding. He, he's having a creative meeting. How are we going to make Christmas Eve come alive this year? And so they decide, hey, what if we could make this into literature outside of the Bible? What if we could take this story and we could do like a poem and we could read it at a Christmas Eve service? And so the priest is all excited. He's like, you know what? I know the guy. There's a local poet and, and he's incredible. What if we could get him to write us a poem? And so they go ahead and they, they meet and he gives him Luke chapter 2 and he says, hey, could you do something creative with this? He's like, okay, I could do something. And so he gives him a couple weeks and the poet comes back and he gives him Oh Holy Night. And that's, that's the actual poem that he presents to him. But here's the crazy thing. The poet loved it so much, he found one of his friends and said, I'm not a musician, I'm just a poet, but could you make this into a song? Okay, so, so this is how this all came about. Now, here's something very interesting to me. Both of the men, the man that wrote the poem and the man that composed the song, neither one of them followed Jesus. Neither one of them. Now, he was able to read Luke chapter 2 and do something creative with it and make something that now today we sing and it does, it absolutely sings about the Savior. But I want you to know something, and I'm not preaching on this today, but it's possible to know a lot of things about God. It's possible to even read God's word and come out and even say some things about God for God and not know God. So um, I just want you to know today that there is power in this carol, but it's much more than just the words that you could sing or know. It's about who's in you. It's about who you're placing your trust in. And so Today, a holy night is truly a song about the beginning of what we know as redemption from our sin. It's the, the first night where Jesus would come into existence on this earth. Now, the interesting thing, so this was in the 1850s, this poem and this song was written. In the early 1900s, about 60 years later, there was this man named Reginald, and he was in his garage one night, and he, 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 was, he was a really smart, brilliant guy, but it was before the age of technology that we know today. And so he's in his garage, and he's messing around with this makeshift, um, what was it called, um, generator that should have been easier to, to come up with okay so this makeshift generator <laughs> and so he grabs a microphone and all these things are new pieces of technology and he pieces them together and, and here's what happens that night he kind of falls upon the first ever am radio song that was ever played in the entire world was oh holy night he messed around in his garage and he was reading luke chapter 2 and then he grabbed his violin and he started to play it and the very first song that was ever broadcasted on the history of the world ever was oh holy night in 1906 so i want you to know that this song it goes back a ways but it's much more than just a traditional song 
It's a song that has great meaning. I'm going to read the first verse to you, and then we're actually going to play this song. And I'm going to just tell you, you can worship to this song. If you want to stand and worship, you can. You can sit and meditate. You can stay still during this. It's a beautiful rendition of this song. But I want you not just to get lost in the, in the prettiness of the song, but really listen to the words. Because word, these words are really are set up for our message today. But the first uh, stanza is, O holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, night divine, the night when Christ was born. This is the setup to Luke chapter 2. Why don't you worship with me with O Holy Night? So this was a depiction of the night. And so many of us, now we don't have a manger scene because we're a fiscally responsible church and we hit our budget on trees, so we stopped. <laughs> but next year, we're going to have a manger scene somewhere over here. <laughs> and so if you see one on deep discount, we're going to get all of our stuff at the end of this Christmas season for next year. So pray for us. But, um, but the manger scene is an incredible depiction of the night when Jesus was born. But I can't help thinking that the manger scene does somewhat of a disservice to what that night was really about about. Can I tell you a couple discrepancies I have in the manger scene and the O Holy Night? Can I just tell you that the three wise men, if they're in your manger scene, they really shouldn't be because they weren't there that night. It's probably more likely that they didn't show up till two years after the night Jesus was born. And I don't want to go into the details, but it's super cool story. But the manger scene, the wise men weren't there. And actually, there weren't just three of them. There were probably many more, but they gave three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But there was probably many more than just three wise men. And then when you look at the night and you see this stable and you know that animals are present, but it looks pretty put together in a manger scene. Can I tell you that Jesus was most likely born in the inside of a rotted out cave that would have actually been where, where that manger was set up and where the animals would go to get shelter um, when, when inclement weather came or, or when they needed to use the restroom. This was the little hollowed out cave that almost every theologian believes is the place where Jesus was born. So even in the, in the nativity scene that we know today, we can kind of deconstruct it a little bit and see that I don't really know that that fully depicts the night when Jesus was born, this holy night. You see, this night was about a teenager who was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Whole different sermon, <laughs> but, but that's a hard conversation to have with her, most likely her teenage fiance who is now betrothed to be married. So that whole conflict is a whole different sermon, but you see this and you don't get to see that in the nativity scene. You get to see her holding baby Jesus, but you don't get to see the nine months of fighting and agony that there must have been between her and Joseph. You don't see the fact that this little teenage girl had to ride somewhere between 80 and 120 miles to get to Bethlehem on a donkey in the Middle East where the weather is not that great. And so, so let me just say this. When, when, when my wife gave birth, we had to drive two miles in a Ford Fusion to a world-class hospital, and it was chaos. <laughs> like for me, I was losing my mind. I, I didn't know what to do. When should we go? The water broke. Should we go now or should we wait? It was chaos for me. I was losing my mind. So imagine <laughs> riding on a donkey for 100 miles to a place in Bethlehem. Now, why did they have to go to Bethlehem? Interesting story. To fulfill prophecy. Because Mary wasn't from Bethlehem. And Joseph, his great descendants of King David, they knew that David um, was from this place, Bethlehem. But we knew that, that, that they had to go back there to fulfill prophecy in Isaiah that said that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. So, so God was arranging things behind the scenes the whole time so that they would have to go back to Bethlehem. Because a census was issued by Caesar that all the people had to be counted. And this was a way to kind of keep the Jews in check. And so they had to travel this great distance back to a place where they didn't have family or friends or anywhere to go. And that was the place where God had fulfilled a prophecy that Jesus would be born there. But this holy night that we see in the nativity, all of these things don't really come through. This was an unsterile, unplanned, and unorganized night, and God still used it. 
I want you to know something about your life. Sometimes for us to really get in a moment where we receive something of depth and of significance from God, everything has to be strategized. Everything has to be planned. The music has to be just right. Can't nobody miss a beat. The, the, the speaker has got to be dynamite. I mean, he's got to pull up my heartstrings. He's got to make me laugh. Then he's got to make me cry. But then it's got to be really intellectual. And if he can't do all those things in 30 minutes, I'm not receiving something from God. You see, but this night, everything about it was unsterile, it was unplanned, it was unorganized. And this is the way that God chose to usher in the Savior of the world. So I want you to know something about your life today. You may look at it and say, man, this isn't how I thought it would be. I thought I'd be in a different place right now. I, I thought my kids would be in a different place right now. I, I thought my marriage would have progressed further than this. I thought a young person, I thought I'd, I'd know a little bit more sure about what I was called to do with my life. I'd know a little bit more about my second or third or my fourth major. I would know. <laughs> I would know. Let me just tell you, God will use you and meet you right in the middle of that unorganized, unplanned part of your life. So don't wait for everything to line up just right. To see God do something significantly, he's probably just standing there waiting for you to turn your eyes to him and away from the chaos. And that's what this night was about. A thrill of hope. A weary world rejoices for yonder night, a new and glorious morning. This is what I want to talk about today. Because if there's anything that I feel like describes the world we live in today, is a weary world. You see, when this song was penned in the 1800s, it was a weary world then. Guess what? It's a weary world today. It's the same world, but it's just maybe even progressively gotten worse and worse. But here's what I want to tell you tonight. This, this author who didn't even know Christ, he knew something about what Luke chapter 2 was describing, that the thrill of hope that would come through a baby being born would forever change the world. That you didn't have to go another day without hope. Now, it doesn't mean that difficulty won't come. It doesn't mean that you won't have incredibly hard seasons of your life, but it meant that there was always going to be a hope found in Jesus that was available to you. So this song says the thrill of hope. I want you to know in the chaos of this night, this manger scene night, in the chaos of it, there was still a thrill of hope. Even with all the unanswered questions, where is he going to be born? Is it going to be a sterile environment? Is he going to get sick? Where are we going to go? We don't have family. We don't have friends. It would take us a couple years to get a place. And, and, and all the while, Joseph probably still doesn't trust me and doesn't believe that this has really come from God. In the chaos of all of that, there was still a thrill of hope. And I need someone to know that today about your life. Even in the chaos of your life today. And some person in this room today, you don't know how you're going to pay a bill. You don't know how that relationship's going to be restored. You don't know how you're going to ever move up in your job. Are you in a dead-end place of life? Let me just tell you something. That a new and glorious morning is coming. Now, it may not come in the form of changing of circumstances, but it can come in the change of your perspective and the way that you place your hope in Christ. A thrill of hope is in front of you today. A new and glorious morning. And so today, our main text, I'm going to kind of get from an unusual place about 600 years before the birth of, birth of Christ. There was a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. Many of you guys would be familiar with his name. But Jerusalem had just fallen in 586 BC. It had just fallen. The city was in ruins. The economy was destroyed. God's people were dispersed everywhere. Now, most of this was because of their own doing, but their city was destroyed. Everything they knew about their life was now completely up in, in, in disheveled everything and I don't know if you're in that place of life but but let me just tell you like if they got to this place that I want to tell you about of hope then I think we can too but these people are in mourning and what Jeremiah does in six short verses is he turns his mourning into rejoicing and I want to see this how did this happen what was the outcome of this Incredible prayer. So in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 20, we're going to read six verses together, and we got a couple points out of it. Verse 20. Jerusalem has fallen. It's destroyed. Jeremiah says, I well remember them. He's talking about all the people that had just been greatly affected by what just happened. And my soul is downcast within me. Let me tell you, someone in this room, you can read ahead if you want, or you can stick with me in the verse. Someone in this room is downcast today. And you may have good reason for it. 
There may be some things that have happened recently in your life that you didn't ask for, that wasn't a result of your sin, wasn't a result of bad management of money or of resource or of people. And you may literally be in this place today and say, yeah, whatever with Christmas, I don't feel it. I'm downcast. I feel something in my soul very different than joy and hope. Well, Jeremiah was right there with you. Verse 21, he says, yet this I call to mind. What is he calling to mind? What is he about to remember? He says, and therefore I have hope. When I remember this, I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. He's remembering this. Yeah, but you guys, you don't get it. I know things don't look like anything good can come out of this. I know that everything you know about your life has just been destroyed. But let me just tell you something. Love from God cannot fail. For his compassions never fail, verse 23. They are new every morning. I'm going to say that again. I need you to read it with me. They are new every morning. You do not have to take yesterday's defeat into tomorrow. I'm just telling somebody today, we live in these cycles, in these progressive seasons, where every single day is just a challenge to do anything. Let me just tell you today that tomorrow is a new morning where everything gets a reset from God. You could have a new day with him. And so he's speaking over people. It's interesting because at first he's talking about God. Now he's shifting to talking to God. He says they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now he's talking to God and he's reminding himself, okay, things are horrible right now. Everything around me looks like it's destroyed. It looks like there's no way up. It looks like nothing good could come from this, but God, you're still good. God, your love cannot fail. Great is your faithfulness. You've been there before. You'll be there again. He's starting to preach to himself. Can I tell you something? On Tuesday, you don't got a preacher in front of you. So you got to learn how to preach to yourself. Open up God's word. Speak it back to yourself. Start to remember what God has done in your life. If you're in a place right now and you're like, up, Pam. Good to see you. If you're in a place right now and you're like, I, I don't see God. And it's been a while since I felt God. Let me just tell you, if you would just go back to a remembrance of what God has done, it'll spark something in your soul to remember his faithfulness. God can speak from a platform of humility of where you say, God, I don't know the answer, but I know that you've done it before. And I know that you'll do it again because your word promises it. So Jeremiah is speaking this. He's speaking about God, now he's speaking to God, and he's about to transition to speaking to himself. Verse 24, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. This is so powerful if we would understand this. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So here's uh, there's a couple quick little points. They're obvious in some ways, but hidden in others. A new day with Christ, right? A new and glorious morning with Jesus. It brings, number one, exactly what you need. Exactly what you need. Now, guess what? I didn't say want. Now, we have, got, no, no, I know you've heard this. And I've heard it too. And I get it like, oh, God's going to meet my needs, not my wants. But why are we still dissatisfied with God when he doesn't do what we want? We know that he doesn't really have a great interest in all of the frills and the wants that we have as humans. He's really interested in meeting our needs for our soul. We know this, but we still let it create separation between us and God. So we know that a new day with Christ brings exactly what you need, not what I want. He says in verse 24, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Two of the hardest things in our culture today is realizing that what we have is exactly what God has portioned to us. It's enough. You have exactly what God has given you and it's enough. But sometimes we're so dissatisfied and then we won't wait on God because we're trying to pursue the portion that God hasn't given to us. So today, and let me just say, you can experience more of God. I'm not saying that you should settle and stay in this place of complacency, but the things that you struggle with about, let me just part about your DNA, about who you are, about how you're wired, you were given the portion that God designed you to have, and there's nothing wrong with what you have in you. So Jeremiah, he's struggling to understand, am I enough? Can I lead people out of this? And so what he says, I say to myself, 
And someone needs to say this to yourself today. The Lord is my portion. Not my boyfriend, not my job, not my career, not my bank account, not my possessions. It's, it's really not any of those things and it never will be. The Lord is your portion. If you would embrace that today, it would change everything about the way you view your life. We see this with the Israelites as they had just been freed from 400 years of slavery. They're wandering around in the desert waiting for God to lead them. And they start to complain because God was doing something supernatural that had never been done. He actually made this thing called manna. It was food from heaven, specially designed by God for the Israelites for this season. And it's dropping out of heaven. It's all over the ground. So every day they're eating this food that they could have never made for themselves. But after a while, they started to complain and say, this isn't enough. They actually started to say, why do we even leave slavery? It would have been better to stay there because we were eating better food than this. So really what they were doing was they were complaining about the portion that God was giving them. And so what they started to do was they would start to hoard the manna and say, hey, I'll take some of your manna, I'll take some. But every single day, the manna would rot at the end of the day. It wouldn't last to the next day because God was trying to prove something to them that I believe he's still proving today. He is enough. You don't have to store up something. God has given and will portion to you exactly what he sees fit. So if you don't have what you think you should and you're in right relationship with God, just know today you have been portioned exactly what God has desired. He's trying to teach us that we need him every day. And not just today, but tomorrow. I keep talking about a new and glorious morning. Can I tell you that tomorrow, God will be exactly what you need. He's already in tomorrow. He's already thought it out. He's already planned and prepared tomorrow for you. But you have to trust him. He's exactly what your marriage needs. You don't need another book. You don't need another counseling appointment. You should do those things in addition to getting your heart and your mind fixed on Jesus. Your marriage needs Jesus, nothing else. If you're struggling with your kids and I don't know how in the world can I get them to actually listen to me and respect me, let me, it's Jesus. And it's just getting on your knees every single night and pleading before God, God, would you give me compassion for this kid because I'm going to knock him out. God, would you, would you give me grace to just keep parenting in a godly way? Would you just give me more time so I don't have to hand them an iPad, but I can, I can sit there and I can spend time with them. What you need In your life is Jesus. If you're weak today, you don't need more strength that comes from you. You need the strength that comes from God. You need to embrace your weakness today. Because we know the Bible says that in our weakness, we are made strong through Christ. Today, don't feel like that's a deficiency because you're feeling weak. Offer that to God and he'll replace it with strength that comes from him alone. Today, if you feel lost, Jesus is what you're looking for. You're not lost because I don't know where I should move or what I should do with my life. You're lost probably because Jesus is calling out to your soul. If you're hurting today, the comfort that you need is found in Jesus alone. You can have conversations and some people will bring you some encouragement, but it'll last about this long. You need the spirit of God to come and wrap over your heart. A new day with Jesus brings exactly what we need. Number two, a new day with Jesus brings the hope to keep going. The thrill of hope. A weary world rejoices. What we need more than anything in this world today, and if the church would rise up on the legs that God has called us, and we would have hope in Jesus, and we wouldn't look to the economy, we wouldn't look to the government, we wouldn't look to anything else, and we would say, my hope is planted and firmly rooted in Jesus alone. I just wonder what the church could do. Verse 25, Jeremiah says, the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. Every one of us, there's hope inside of you, but I just don't know what you hope in. I I know today, I'm going to call it, I'm hoping the Vikings win. I know you guys are probably sick of me, but I am. I just got to give it to the church and let you just pray at the altar today. We got a big game against New England. Preach, come on. My hope is that they win today. My hope, and you can fill that in for yourself, the things that you hope for, but the Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. You all, and and we all, we all hope in things that don't matter, but let me just ask you, about the things that do matter, where is your hope? 
Someone once said, you can live 40 days without food. You can live eight days without water. You can live four minutes without oxygen, but you can't live more than a few seconds without hope. Some of us were suffocating in our soul because we've placed our hope in all the wrong places. And we've placed it in our job and our job's not coming through for us. We've placed it in an advancement and it hasn't happened. We've placed it in something that God has not commissioned or something that God is not over. And we wonder why we still don't feel completion and we don't feel like anything's changing in our soul. It's because we've placed our hope in the wrong place. When you place your hope in a person, let me say this, you place your hope in your husband or your wife, they're a person and they do have faults and they sin and they'll they'll mess it up. If all your hope is in your spouse and there's some marriages, it's not a lack of love, it's a last, it's a product of your placing all of your hope and your weight into that person. And when they fail, you take it as if God failed. They're a person who makes mistakes. Redirect our hope and place it in Jesus. Where and in who are you placing your hope today? You're placing it somewhere. You have to ask yourself the question, where and in who? In Hebrews chapter 10, the author says, let us hold. Go like this, hold. Okay, start with an open hand. One, two, three, hold. Let us hold unswervingly. That means, that, dude, it's going to get twisty. And it's going to get bumpy. And you're going to have to make a decision. I'm going to hold on no matter what. Or I'm going to let go when it gets difficult. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. You can talk about it all day long in the church. You can nod your head to the sermon. You can say all these things. But when life smacks you in the face, whose hope are you going to hold on to? Are you going to hope in yourself and your ability and your intellect and your understanding? And and you're going to get yourself through? That's the season I, I find myself there all the time. I'm going to be honest with you in the church. When a problem comes, my usual default is how can I fix this? Not God, where are you at in the middle of this? I'll start at fixing, and then usually after I screw it up more or fail to fix it, then I'll say, hey, would have been a good start. Maybe I should reprogram my mind to start at finding my hope and my trust in Jesus. So today, question, have you let go of hope? And instead, held on to fears. Some people in this world, you hold on unswervingly to your fear. You hold on unswervingly to your doubt. You hold on unswervingly to your inability, to your past mistakes, to your failures. There's some people in this room, no matter what life does, you still think you're not good enough. No matter what God does, you still think he's not enough. You hold on unswervingly to the fear and the doubt and the shame rather than holding on unswervingly to the hope that comes from Jesus alone. So today, if I could tell you one thing, and if you could leave here saying, I got to just figure out a way to let go of the hope and hold on to the hope. See, there's not a week that has went by. And the other day, a super emotional day, and I'm not an emotional person at all, but I was thinking about this hope, and I was really remembering what it was like to be lost and it's been a while it's, i gave my heart to christ 15 years ago now so it seems like a lifetime ago but i started to remember the hopelessness that i used to wake up with every single day and the goal for the day was just get drugs that was it to be honest with you that was a win that day was just to find something that could hold me over to the next day and that was my pursuit every single day it was just how can i escape my life enough so that I really don't feel the pain of what I'm going through. And this week, I just kept remembering the hopelessness of my life, what it was like to not have Jesus. And man, it just, it crushed me. And and it brought a reminder to me of, of a pastor. Now, a lot of times the church, they look at pastors as, you know, they, they got it all together. You know, their, their prayers are more effectual than yours. Marilyn, you say that to me all the time. I'm like, yeah, that's not true. Your prayers are just the same as mine. But, but a, lot of times, a lot of times you look at a pastor um, as someone who's got it all figured out. They talk about hope. They talk about joy. They talk about love. So they got to be living it, right? It's got to be something that flows out of their life from every direction, And then there was this pastor a few months ago, and you've probably, many of you heard this story, but there was a pastor in Southern California at 30 years old, he had three kids, a wife, pastored a mega church, and he lost his hope. And on Friday morning at 11 o'clock, as he was preparing a message to preach that Sunday, he committed suicide. 
crushed his church. And I look at that person today and I, and I, and I wonder, where did he lose hope? Where, what was the moment where the hope of, of Jesus wasn't enough? And so I, I want to show this and this, this wrecked me, but I, I'm doing it not, not as a memorial, but as a, I want you to reflect through this because they showed this at his memorial service and um, it's kind of the progression of his life. But I want you to see someone that knew about the hope. He knew about who Jesus was, but it was so easily to hold on unswervingly to the doubt and the fear and the insecurity to the point of it costing his life. So this is about a six minute video. I'd encourage you to watch this and see yourself in it. Let me see, Andrew. Show me, bud. What's up, Andrew? Is it your birthday, bud? What's wrong with Andrew? You don't want to be at Disneyland? You want to go back home? Look in the camera. You're going to get lost, young man. Do I have to push anything? No, it's on. Hold on, Andrew. Two. Birthday. Well, hello, my name is Andrew, and I, I work with our student ministries here, and uh, I'm super excited about what God's doing already, and I'm pumped today to talk to you about youth culture, specifically uh, the next generation and how we can reach them. Let me just say that no matter who you are, there's a message within um, this today for you. You could be uh, have kids, uh, you really need to hear this. No kids, you need to hear this. Uh, you're young, you're old, like 37 plus. Um, you need to hear this, I'm just kidding. So you see here, it's, it's, a, it's a glazed donut and then they put ice cream in there and then I put little fruity pebbles because it's his breakfast, so. And it's just, you just, So good. Does anyone else like want one of these? In other words, what's in you is gonna come out of you. What bless you, ma'am, sir, I don't know, whatever. Bless you, wow. See what was in her just came out of her. <laughs> I couldn't resist that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, even just the fact that Andrew and I get to sit here together on this stage, on this day, and the fact that this is an intergenerational driven church. And I am so humbled to be a part of this. Uh, just to be a part of my family um, and a part of this church family is it, just, it's honoring, it's humbling. Um, I, I'm just like, man, I'm still learning. And I, I, and I often doubt myself. I often feel like I don't have much to say. I'm still learning. And, and you guys are kind of intimidating sometimes, but um, God has taught me a lot through this journey.
my entire lifetime just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. And the way Dad would say that, and you heard it said already, is that this life on this planet is just the first inch. And one of the conversations that me and Dad had over the last couple of years was about this concept of heaven. This is a verse that has been so helpful to me. So I want to read this. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, this is written to a church, written to us. We want you to know, so, that, so God wants us to know, the authors of scriptures want us to know. We want you to know what will happen to the believers, those who believe in Jesus Christ, that he really came, really lived, really died for our sins. We want you to know what happened to the believers who have died, so you will, watch this, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Because Jesus really lived, really died, the Bible wants us to know what happened to the people who have believed that and died. He, they want us to, to grieve in a way where there's hope. We don't have to grieve with no hope. Here's just the one thing I would want you to hear today. This is the bottom line. I hope every one of us understands this. And while I have your attention, I just want to tell you, this is so important. You were designed for a person and a place. You were created for a person and a place. And that place is heaven. And the only way to get there is through a relationship with this person named Jesus. God's going to do something much better than this. And we get to look forward to it. And we get to make our plans accordingly. And it gives us hope in the here and now. So the reason I show that is um, it just seemed like he should have it all together. Talks about hope, talks about love, talks about joy. I don't pretend to stand in front of you guys to tell you that I got it all figured out. But I want us to continually look towards the thrill of hope that comes in a new day. I wonder if he could have just made it to the next day. If God could have just done something in his soul and sparked something new inside of him, just wait one more day. I wonder what holding on for just another moment, what it could have done to him. If he could have just made it to the new and glorious morning that we sing about in a holy night. I need to tell someone today, don't give up. Don't lose hope. You're not, you may not be here where you're thinking about just giving up on life itself, but someone else in this room, you're about to give up on God. You're about to give up on your marriage. You're about to give up on your calling. You're about to give something up because it got really difficult and you don't see God in it. I need to tell someone today that a new and glorious morning is coming. You need to hang on to the hope because one moment with Jesus can change everything. If he would have just had one more moment could have changed everything Lazarus was dead for four days but one moment with Jesus he got up and he was healed and he was alive one moment with Jesus with the woman who had the issue of blood and for 12 years she was afflicted she was a social outcast she had no belonging but one moment with Jesus everything changed in a moment the man who had laid by the pool at Bethsaida for 38 years, he couldn't walk. And in a moment, Jesus walks by and says, pick up your mat and go. In a moment with Jesus, he was healed forever. And I need someone in this room to know today, you don't have the answer in yourself. But one moment with Jesus can change everything. And don't you dare wait till next Sunday morning to have your moment with Jesus. Don't let a whole week go by where the world punches you. It kicks you. It tells you things about you that aren't true and then show up next week thinking that God can just reverse and change all the patterns of the week. Tomorrow, God, you are my portion. You are enough. You are the answer. It's in you, not in me. I'm not going to my job because it's the answer. The Lord is my portion. A new and glorious morning is coming finish with this scripture i'm going to speak over you and we're going to finish i'm sorry i went late but we needed to today romans chapter 13 
It says the hour has come. Someone needs to proclaim this over your life. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber. We're sleeping on Jesus a little bit because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. I need to tell someone today, the night is nearly over on your depression. A new day is coming. The night is nearly over on your unbelief. A new day is coming. A night is nearly over on your anxiety. A new day is coming. The night is nearly over on your guilt from your past that you carry into your future. It's almost over. A new day is coming. The night is nearly over on your spiritual separation. It's over. A new day is coming. The night is nearly over on your anger towards somebody. A new day is coming. A new day with Christ is in front of you. If you would choose to place your hope in him, he could change it all in a moment. And so I hope that the next time you sing this song, a holy night, you'd sing it a little differently. You'd sing it about the hope that's found in Jesus alone. And each week as we go through these carols, I hope that you're inspired, encouraged, not just by a song you know, but by the roots and the depths of who God is in the midst of it. So as we close this morning, if you're here and you say, I need the thrill of hope. I need to embrace a new day and, and I'm not leaving here without it. We're going to have some people up here. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to pray if you need to receive Christ and you say, I'm outside of relationship. I don't even know him as Savior. But today I'm not leaving here without the thrill of hope that comes from knowing him as my Savior. Or if you're here today and you just say, I need someone to pray with me. Good, bad, ugly, we're going to celebrate. We'll have people available to do that as well. Would you stand, worship with us as we close? Can't wait to see you next week.